All right, guys, we are about to start on my uh, section with Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's one of my absolute favorite writers. Uh, really, really enjoy this guy. Um, but he's difficult, not going to lie. He is a complex dude. So before we get into talking about him, actually, we need to talk about the movement that's associated with him, and that's called transcendentalism. Now, if you're looking around in your book, we're on page 360, uh, has the basic notes on this for what you need for class. But transcendentalism is something that it, teaching at a Christian school can be a little bit difficult for people because it does run counter to some Christian thought. Uh, and really that comes from Emerson. Uh, some problems he had with God, Emerson, the guy we're going to be talking about today, had some issues when his young wife died and he uh, you know, had some struggles with his faith. And um, you know, found peace in a different way of seeing things. And I'm not going to really say it's the way things should be, but we'll, we'll get to what he believed in a second. And it got him a lot of trouble while he was alive as far as with the religious community. So transcendentalism, let's get the basics of it. Um, this is developed around the character of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, 1830s, 1840s, that time period, it's about a 10 to 15 year period where it really hits its heyday. And after that, uh, it just really kind of disappears. Um, what was going on at the time was we had the Industrial Revolution happening, which really made it seem like people were more and more interchangeable. You know, you could be replaced with a machine, in fact. So, you know, what did it matter? Uh, the individual lost their power. But when we look at uh, Emerson, Emerson kind of rebelled against that and felt like the individual has a massive amount of power. Sorry, I've seen how awful my beard looks. Uh, uh, the individual has a ton of power, and he realized that. So, uh, and he wrote about that. Uh, and that was like the big thing for transcendentalists, at least one of the big pillars, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, transcendentalist movement lasted about, about 10 years. It produced, it says, only two major books. One of them we're going to read some excerpts from. That's Emerson's essays. The other one was by Henry David Thoreau, who's a personal hero of mine, who wrote something called uh, Walden. By the way, Thoreau, one of the ugliest people alive, had an awful beard like mine. Me and him probably could have been brothers, as ugly as we both are. So uh, that guy, though, is, is had major impact. And we'll talk about him more a little bit later because I'm probably going to bring in pieces of um, Civil Disobedience, which he wrote, which I think is really, really important to read. All right? All right. Um, let's talk a little about Emerson, what got him in trouble. Um, it says, and I'm reading this straight from your book. According to Emerson, the human mind is so powerful it can unlock any mystery from the intricacies of nature to the wonders of God. So, you know, the idea here was that the human, the individual, is so powerful that they could even, you know, begin to unravel the secrets of God, which obviously is not true. That's very Tower of Babel sounding. Um, but that wasn't the biggest thing that got him in trouble, and it was this. In 1833, in a speech at Harvard University, uh, he took his ideas a little further than what he had been talking about before. Uh, it proposed that every soul in all of nature was part of an oversoul, a universal spirit to which all beings return after death. In other words, he was trying to say that every being is a part of the mind of God. Now, that definitely didn't hold up well with the people at Harvard. He was banned from being there for a long time. Not until really the end of his life was he invited back. But uh, it definitely caused him some issues in the religious community. Now, people still love this guy, but it definitely caused him some issues with the religious community. But it did, it got him some attention from other areas, uh, some that were really important. Um, a couple of people they mention over on page 361 of your book, a guy named Amos Bronson Alcott, who uh, had a really great idea about schools back in the 1800s. This guy believed that uh, memorization was a terrible thing and that really the best way to teach should be, you know, teaching kids to think, debate, challenge, discuss, you know, the things that I really wish we could get more of. And, of course, Thoreau, who was also a major disciple of his. So that's our basics of transcendentalism. Um, let's look over at... Let's start on page 367 in your book. And this is going to be a small, 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 small excerpt from his essay called Nature, which I love this essay, and this is a good part of it. It's really not enough, to be honest, but uh, it's neat. I like it, and we're going to, we're going to read some of it. So 361, 367, apologies. It says, Nature is a setting that fits equally well a comic or a morning piece. In good health, the air is cordial, uh, of increased virtue, crossing a bare common in snow puddles at twilight under a clouded sky without having in, in, in my thoughts any occurrence of special good fortune, I have enjoyed a perfect exhilaration. I am glad to the brink of fear. Now, I love this beginning, man. This has got some great lines. The uh, nature works well whether you're happy or sad. You know, this is an image we've saw, seen in several of our other poems. They're the fireside poets. 
They talked about the importance of nature, which this is a huge part of the U.S. writing in the 1800s because nature was just surrounding us. And there were no big cities that were devoid of nature like New York City is today. That wasn't a thing. So he talks about how you know amazing it is. And I love this image of him uh, walking through some puddles of snow and just breathing in the cool air and the way it just impacts him. And that's terrific. The, I am glad to the brink of fear is a tremendous sentence. It says, in the woods, too, a man casts off his years as the snake his slough, slough. I'm not sure how to say that word. And at what period soever of life is always a child. In the woods is perpetual youth. Within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign. A perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the woods we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Now this is a huge part of, of uh, Emerson's beliefs. And that idea is that there's nothing that nature can't fix. Just no matter how bad you feel, spending time out there in God's creation is how we kind of recharge and rebuild who we are. Which is so sad today because we just don't spend time out there. You know, we're all too busy sitting on our phones and sitting inside and, and doing inside things. And when we're outside, it's typically because of we we're having to do yard work or something. And, you know, whether a lot of you, it's like, well, I feel that way at the beach. And I guess that's an example, although the beach makes me want to vomit. But, I mean, for some of you, that's, that's your, some of you feel like that's your safe place. And there's the element of nature that's involved there is the thing. For me, it's the mountains, man. If I could be in the, live in the mountains, I don't know if, I think my heart, my blood pressure would plummet and I wouldn't have issues with it anymore because it's just everything about being outside and that clean air and uh, you know being able to see the beautiful scenery is just that's that's what I love so I get this I get what Emerson's saying so standing on the bare ground my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space all means ego, all mean egotism vanishes I become a transparent eyeball that's a horrible line I became a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The, uh, the currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. Now, there's his transcendentalism again, showing up this idea that, you know, the individual is part of this, you know, oversoul, he called it. Now, I don't agree with that part of his, his writing. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's not my thing. But, uh, you know, it's not offensive. I mean, I, you know, it, it's a cool way of thinking. It's just I don't think it's realistic. It says, the name of the nearest friend sounds then foreign and accidental. To be brothers, to be acquaintances, master or servant, is then a trifle and a disturbance. I am the lover of uncontained and immortal beauty. In the wilderness, I find something more dear and connate than in the streets or villages. In the tranquil landscape, and especially in the distant line of the horizon, man beholds somewhat as beautiful as his own nature. So a little d play on words there, the concept of nature. He's not just talking about nature like outside nature, but also human nature. Um, but again, focusing on how beautiful and peaceful the uh, you know the world outside is. You know, when I'm filming this, it's uh, let's see, it's November 17th, and uh, we actually had a little bit cooler weather today. And it was really nice. You know, I get to wear a sweater. And uh, leaving this morning and feeling that cool air was just it made the day feel so much more palatable and like I was going to enjoy it. Uh, I kept trying to find excuses to go outside and work today, but I don't think everyone likes the cool weather as much as me. So, um, but he's right. You know, this is where we can find peace. It says, the greatest delight which the fields and woods minister is the suggestion of an occult relation between man and the vegetable. I am not alone and unacknowledged. They nod to me and I to them. The uh, waving of the boughs in the storm is new to me and old. It takes me by surprise and yet is not unknown. Its effect is like that of a higher thought or a better emotion coming over uh, me when I deemed I was just thinking justly or doing right. When he mentions vegetable here, he doesn't mean literally vegetables. Like we think about them, he means plants. But he's talking about this, you know, weird relationship between humans and nature, particularly the plants, uh, which that's, again, you know, the, the, I, I get that. Uh, I used to work on the Appalachian Trail. I love the forest. Um, I love the forest when there's mountains. I don't like the forest here in Mobile. But uh, it's a gr it, it, this is terrific. I mean, he, he gets it. He understands the power of nature to influence people's emotions. Okay, the last paragraph that we have is yet in, it is – it is certain that the power to produce this delight does not reside in nature, but in man or in harmony of both. It is necessary to use these pleasures with great temperance, for nature is not always tricked in holiday attire, but the same scene which, uh, which yesterday breathed perfume and glittered as for the frolic of the nymphs is overspread with melancholy today. Nature always wears the colors of the spirit. To a man laboring under calamity, the heat of his own fire hath sadness in it. Then there is a kind of contempt in the landscape felt by him who just lost by death a dear friend. The sky is less grand as it shuts down over less worth in the population. So 
I don't have my book on screen here. I'm looking at my book here. I realize that I've got the camera much closer today. I'm trying to do something different with my tripod. I apologize. It looks like I'm just staring into nothing over here. Uh, the book's right here. Um, this last paragraph, he's talking about, you know, nature's not always friendly, and a lot of it is dependent. The emotions we pull out of it aren't inherent in nature. They're inherent in us. You know, so one day the fire that you're sitting at might be a peaceful and calming thing. Another day it might be where you're, you know, you're, you're sad. And so it now takes on a melancholy view. So he's pointing out that we are the ones who really drive those emotional attachments. But nature helps to accentuate those. All right. So, you know, I think a lot of you get this. Again, I live in an area, you know, here in Mobile where the beach is a, is a sacred place to a lot of you. So I understand that probably some of you get this. Others of you, like, you know, are lucky and your family travels and you get to go to places like Gatlinburg or, or things like that where you see mountains. And that's also really, really powerful for a lot of you. So great little excerpt of an essay. The actual thing's a little bit longer. Now, flipping over to the next page on page 369, we're going to get another very short excerpt of another essay. And this one's called Self-Reliance. And uh, I like this one too, although this one's a little bit harder to unpack, okay? Um, in this one, he's basically encouraging people to not follow blind conformity, but to rely on yourself and your own opinions and beliefs, which is a great lesson. Um, poses problems at times, but still is a good lesson. So let's look at this, 369. He says, there is a time in every man's education. Let me see if I can actually rearrange this. I'm not sure if this will work or not. Sorry, there's my hand. No, that's not better. That's not better. All right, well, there's the book. You saw that. All right, I'm going to stare here at the ground and look at the book. It says, there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better or worse as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. Now, that's the definition of self-reliance. He's saying at some point we all realize that we're gonna, what we're going to get out of this, this life is what we put into it and what we work towards. And he says everyone needs to realize that at some point. Um, he says we, realize, we come to this realization at different points of our life. We come to it for different reasons. Some of us it's for, you know, it's good things. We realize we were instilled with a work ethic from our parents or teachers. Some of us we have to hit hard times and realize that we actually have to work for ourselves. He says the power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. I love that sentence. The idea is that, you know, no one knows what we can do until we try it, you know. Uh, we're the only ones who know what we can do, and we'll only know that once we put in the effort. So you have to get out there and try. Um, nor does he know until he has tried. Not for nothing one, no, yeah, that's right. Not for nothing one face, one character, one fact makes much more impression on him than another none. This sculpture in the memory is not without pre-established harmony. The eye was placed where one ray should fall that it might testify of all of that particular ray. It, gotta be honest with you guys, this is one of those things about Emerson that bothers people. Um, I have no idea what he's saying there. It sounds really pretty. Uh, and that's what he was known for. That people would come and listen to him speak and were like, uh, he, he talks beautifully, I have no clue what he said. Um, he gets very, very, um, this dude's a poet, even though these are essays, this dude's a poet, he really is. Uh, and he claimed to be a poet. He didn't think he was a very good one. And honestly, I think he's a much better essayist. But you run into passages like this, which are a little bit muddy. But we, here we go. We're going to get bounced out of it. So we but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. It may be safely trusted as proportionate and of good issues, so it be faithfully imparted. But God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him. No muse befriends, no invention, no hope. So then he's saying, pointing out again how we don't really go all out. We don't give it our full effort. Um, and he's saying that God's not going to you know, reward our half effort, which you know, even though he had some issues with the religious people of his time, that statement is not wrong. I really feel like God blesses us when we you know, put 100% behind everything we do, no matter how small it is. And when we're all lazy and barely put any effort in, I think that we should expect to get bad results. Okay. Now, here's a little bit of advice he gives us. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. That's a famous line. It's about the importance of trusting yourself. Accept the place that divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception uh, perception that the absolutely trustworthy was stirring at their heart, working through, through their hands, predominating in all their being. So again, he's saying, you know, 
the greatest of us have always trusted in their own abilities and themselves. Now, you, you get help from other people. No one's saying you can do it by yourself. But you do have to at least have some confidence in yourself or greatness just isn't going to find you, right? He says, and we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, but guides, redeemers, and benefactors, obeying the almighty effort and advancing on chaos and the dark. What a very, you know, spiritual sounding thing there. All right. Now we have the ellipsis there, the dot, dot, dot. So we're going to skip ahead to another part. This is, this is later in the essay. So society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue is most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators but names and customs. So he's saying conformity is what society demands from us. But he's saying self-reliance, which is what he's talking about, is kind of the opposite. You know, Conformity is great in some areas, I guess. There's some areas where we need to conform to things. But, you know, overall, we need to learn to stand up against some things that we don't see a purpose in. Now, I don't mean fighting useless battles. But, you know, relying on yourself and not relying on society to tell you right from wrong, that's an important detail, okay? All right, page 370, in a very small part, and then we're done. It says, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. There you go, great line. He's saying, if you want to be a man, you've got to learn to go against the flow. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore it if it be goodness. I love that sentence, too. Nothing is the last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Absolve you to yourself, and you shall have the suffrage of the world. So, again, he's pointing out that, uh, you know, don't just accept something's good or bad, you know, Really think about it and look into it to see if that's really true, okay? Uh, man, what useful, I mean, this was written in the 1830s or 1840s. Think about how useful that is today where, you know, we let the media define good and bad for us and we just take it and run and we make it like a pillar of our heart on something that we heard on the news. I mean, it's ridiculous how quickly we will, you know, alter who we are based on some really ridiculous statements. Okay, last paragraph. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradicts everything you said today. Ah, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Is it so bad then to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. I love that last part. Um, the greatest of men, definitely in their time, were misunderstood. It seems almost all of them. I'm sure there's exceptions, but it seems like for the most part that's the case. Um, think about what the people he listed, how they were treated when they were alive. And you know what? That's... That's if no one's like coming in opposition to you, you're not saying anything worth opposing. So, you know, it's 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 important to say something in your life, and most of us spend it saying nothing and saying it well. To be honest with you, all right, guys. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of trip through Emerson here. It's not much. Uh, your book really limited it. Uh, I, I kind of hate that. And you know, in future years when I have more time, I may try to actually give you some more of these that are really strong that I want to. Uh, it shakes the whole thing. Okay, uh, that I want to really show you. So anyway, I apologize for a couple of technical issues. I was messing with the camera, trying some new things to try to, you know, um, I don't know, just make make things a little bit better, uh, you know. But you know, me staring like this the whole time might not be one of those things. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you liked Emerson. I love Emerson, so I hope you like him. Anyway, guys, I hope you have a great afternoon, a great evening as we're getting close to Thanksgiving holidays. I'm really excited about that. I know you are, too. So, uh, you know, let's have a strong finish here. All right. Uh, have a wonderful evening.